I think, gents, it's fair to say it's been a very disappointing couple of uh, days and couple of games for the US. A bit of a wake-up call ahead of the World Cup, just, what, 54 days away now until that all kicks off in Qatar. So we're about to find out a lot about this young US team, I think, in the days, weeks, and, well, less than a couple of months ahead. So uh, initial thoughts, Nick, as time ticks away down in Mercia. Uh, what were your real takeaways from this game against Saudi Arabia? Well, it's really uncomfortable to be in a position where you're kind of creating scenarios in which the performance could somehow be explained in an acceptable manner. And that's what I feel like I'm doing for two straight games. Like, is he not trying to tip his hand? Is he out there just playing as basic as possible? Does he not want us to think or, or the opposition to think that he's settled on his lineup? And I hate that it's it's all alternatives. I'm, I'm trying to come up for reasons why they look like they haven't played together before. Uh, or they look un uninspired or uninstructed. And that's there are nations, again, I'm not advocating this and they would never do it, but there are nations where guys get fired for stuff like this because the World Cup is so important. And so I guess to go back to what we talked about last week, Joe, overall, I'm just kind of feeling dismal. I'm feeling like I get maybe, do the math, let's say we live to 80, we get to, we get to see 14 15 World Cups in our life, if we're lucky. And I feel like we're about to waste one. And the game is over, I can confirm now. Full-time in Mercia, Saudi Arabia, nil. U.S. men's national team, nil. And an injury hit Saudi Arabia. About to start a goalkeeper, yeah. captain, a couple of their main defenders. Yes, the U.S. had injuries as well, Andy. But this really wasn't the kind of performance you wanted to see after that demoralizing defeat against Japan and how bad that was, right? You wanted to see some kind of reaction from the US. And I think in the first half, we saw it with Pulisic and McKenney a few times in down the left, a couple of opportunities, but really just half chances. So mm -hmm. um, Greg Bellhalter wanted a reaction, wanted a team performance. I don't think we saw that tonight against Saudi Arabia. <laughs> now, if I'm a US fan tuning in to watch us here, I'm intrigued to get your comments and questions coming in, everyone. Um, I'd be very despondent like nick said is that how you're feeling too well i mean four shots against japan seven against saudi arabia so you know the, these are very very small incremental improve no it, it was it was putrid from from the very beginning and from the very beginning of the game against spain 11 shots in two games from a team that is supposed to be peaking now heading into a world cup this is obviously not what you want to see i do think that uh, the injuries that they're dealing with right now are particularly uh, troublesome, given the fact that Anthony Robinson, one of, the, if not the first name onto the team sheet, once the World Cup gets here, as good as he's been for the national team and for Fulham this season. I also think uh, I came around during this game further and further to the idea that Yunus Musa uh, really is the missing piece in, in this team at the moment, because we saw the midfield with a double pivot against Japan. Tyler Adams had some help in there. It still didn't work because there was no ball progressor in front of the double pivot. Well, we switch away from the double pivot and it's just Tyler Adams in there. You've got two in front of him. And the fact that Yunus Musa wasn't one of them alongside Weston McKinney, I, I think is, is actually a much bigger issue for this team uh, than anything anybody else is talking about, because it is the ball. It's not just the ball progression, but it's the retention as well. When they come under pressure, He's always there as an option to play them out of trouble. He is the one player that can get them out of those situations. And he combines along the left a lot so well with Anthony Robbins. So I, maybe, maybe, maybe I'm grasping, trying to find something positive here. But I do think that those two individuals specifically, maybe more than anybody else in the team, uh, the impact that they have on everyone around them uh, individually and as a collective unit, I, I, I do think we realized how important they are in these two games. Yeah, I mean, I, Andy, we, we have the same wavelength because I've literally just written about Robinson and Musa in my What We Learned uh, column, which has gone up on NBCSports.com as we speak. It's up there right now. So head over there and read that as you're tuning in with us because, yeah, it just seems like the ability to keep the ball and have someone link midfield and attack and give the U.S. some kind of fluidity and cohesion and the gaps that were there in front of the centre-backs and in all over midfield. Musa fills those roles. And then for Robinson out on the left, he's so adventurous. We've seen that for Fulham time and time again. And when you have players that you know can have quality and will keep the ball or put in a good cross, if you're an attacking player or a striker or midfielder, that kind of incentivizes you to keep running and keep making those runs. But what we've seen for the US the last couple of games is a lot of attacking players not 
I mean, Pulisic kind of went mess, missing in the second half today because I think they kind of just realized, I'm, even if I keep making these runs, no one's going to find me. No one's going to feed me. And that's a really big problem. And Tim Weyer... And the space was there. That, that Saudi there. Arabia back line was super high. And anybody in midfield that can connect a pass, pick a through ball, there are plenty of chances there. And that was the most frustrating thing is because you could see it. You could see all that space in behind. And the only way they tried to exploit it was from a center back to a fullback on the opposite side, a 60 yard diagonal ball. Sure. It works great. If you've got somebody on the other end of it, that can do something with well, it. They just didn't today. They did. They, they wanted to play long, right? Long and Zimmerman, no pun intended. They just wanted to get them to play the ball long in behind, get McKenney and Pulisic running. And it did not work. Um, okay. Let's get to some of your questions. A lot of questions coming in. Thank you guys. Um, okay. City's imaginary squad depth. I mean, it's not imaginary. They have a lot of good squad depth. Anyway, um, how much is on the system and how much is on the players? Nick Mandola, I'm coming to you. I guess this is kind of a question that we always look at with Greg Berhalter in mind, don't we? Yeah. uh, He's, again, unless we're missing something, unless this is, I don't want to give away something I've figured out. I know the Wales coach is here. Um, the players have not benefited or the players have not helped him in any way, shape or form. But I have to imagine with these guys, kind of what you're talking about, the diagonal balls being cooked, um, Joe Scally coming in, as I think Annie pointed out off the air, uh, if if the plan was what we th- saw the plan to be in the first half, then he should be starting. And um, I think he's too stubborn to get enough wins and he needs a reality check. Someone needs to sit him down and say, look, if you want to go out on your own terms, fine, but it's not going to be, capturing the imagination of the nation. I would go scrolling through the stats. I always like to look at the stats to make sure in case I've missed something on the player ratings. And I'll tell you what, um, Dest's stats were pretty good. I think six of seven duels um, playing on the left side when we know he wants to play on the right. Yedlin, I thought, was bright in the game. Zimmerman was better from Friday. Long was bad again. And I think if you keep trying to, you look at it and if he, It's the most obviously thing. He's a weakness. He's not necessarily even a top center back in MLS. And I hate dogging on him, but he shouldn't be starting a World Cup game. It shouldn't happen. And if he's starting with Zimmerman in back-to-back games before the World Cup, you're saying, I think we're going to start this guy. And if it works, it'll be luck. It won't be because he was right. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of great questions coming in around these topics, Nick, as well. So we'll keep it rolling. I mean, Andy, this is the big question, I think. Fans are so frustrated by what they've seen through qualifying, finishing third in CONCACAF, and these last couple of games and sort of maybe Bohalter's general attitude. You can see the question I'm going to pull out here from Jonathan Rincon. Should Greg Bohalter be fired before or after the World Cup? I mean, I personally don't think it's going to happen before the World Cup. U.S. soccer has totally gone all in on him. And at the very least, they're going to give him these three games. And if they absolutely tank, lose all three, don't get through the group stage, then I think that's a legitimate discussion to have right he's had the cycle he's had these young players but what do you think do you, is there actually a question right now because looking at the lineup today <laughs> he played a few players with the world cup in mind and i thought he would have given yeah. some of the other younger less experienced players more of an opportunity today but it's almost like that bunker down mentality and he wanted to get a positive result today against saudi arabia and he didn't get it so is the pressure kind of on bill harter now yeah, it is. Is that a yes or no question or a before or after question? Because you can ask that a couple of different ways and say, yes, uh, he, that he should eventually at some point, or, or or is it a matter of when? I don't know that going to the World Cup and, and even, you know, if they play like this at the World Cup and they manage to get a couple of results, that doesn't change a ton in my mind. It's not so much about the results. It's about the kind of, it's kind of about the way the team plays and it's not the style that they play with. And I think that that is to, to something that Nick always goes to is, you know, Berhalter being a bit stubborn and having to do things his way. And he knows the best way. I think he, I think he places way too much value and priority on that. And I think Americans do in general as well. And I think that was something that, You know, if you go back four and eight and 12 years, kind of the World Cup cycle, uh, you know, uh, timeline, we always had a team that could fight, that could counter, that that was stronger as games went on, teams that kind of willed themselves over the line, you know, the American spirit, if you will. And we, 
I don't know, we, we look down on ourselves, I think, at times for that, saying, well, that's not how the game is meant to be played. It can be played better, you know, technically, stylistically and everything. You know, we looked at what Spain did internationally and thought, well, why can't we just do that? Well, because we're not Spain. That's the reason why. And so I think trying to do anything, you know, other than being who we are, the players that we have in the player pool, who we've always been, I think is probably where he has gone wrong or the most wrong during his tenure as coach, because it is nice to say that we're going to play this way because he had some success doing it in MLS for a few years. And, and those crew teams were awesome. Credit to Greg Berhalter for that, all of those things, but this is different. And the fact that he's trying to play that way in the international game, we talked about it last week. It's, it's just not how the international game is played. Make yeah. it as simple as you possibly can internationally. And he's trying to make it more and more complex i think with every single game with every you know every lineup that he picks every tactical change or idea it's just i don't know there, there's a lot going on at a time where you want yeah. to have everything settled and everything figured out and still trying to work it out now that's very true andy i think this is something we've talked about a lot over the last year or so the fact that the u.s has had you know with covid and the travel restrictions the last few years they played mostly against Concacaf opponents world cup qualifying had a couple of games against Uruguay and Morocco, not their full strength teams, and haven't really been tested in a world kind of global level like they have been in previous cycles and previous times before going to the World Cup where you kind of knew where they were stacking up. And now they face Japan and Saudi Arabia, two teams go into the World Cup, and it looked really bad in both games. And I think it's a huge wake-up call to think, hang on a minute, we've been living in almost like a, a, a CONCACAF bubble, if you will, for the last few years. And now, injuries aside, I get it, there's a few big injuries. But realistically, what, three or four of those guys might come into the starting lineup if they're fit enough? But there's not going to be a huge difference between the team we saw today and the team that kicks off against Wales in 53 days' time in, in Qatar. So huge concern. I'm going to get to the questions. There's so many great questions coming in. Uh, one of them kind of relates to from Kazim here. Uh, are PFOC and Sergeant locks because the rest of the nines were bad? And these two play against World Cup players in their leagues every week. Um, Nick, do you want to take that? Because I think this is like a larger question for us, right? Who impressed? Who struggled? I think for, but it was difficult for, for all the strikers over these two games. Not many chances created. Pepe had a very low number of touches in the first half. Felt a bit sorry for him. But what are your takes on, on the striker situation? Because I know we're all huge uh jordan p Falk fans here at pst right what's well, funny is that i would consider myself yes a fan of how he plays but it's almost like if, if you say huge i almost feel like i'm a stretch it's just the guy who looks like the best chance of producing something peppy uh was fine I, I would say like he's but he's just not proven himself um at this level he's not scoring against uh, and the same is true for Jesus Ferreira, who I thought was bright and rifled off a good shot soon upon coming to the game. I do want veterans. I want guys playing against um, the best area. And on days like today where Pulisic doesn't have it and Weston McKenney, I mean, two games in a row where I thought his he was trying to outdo himself with giveaways on bad parts of the field. Um, mm -hmm. I actually felt bad. I thought, let me point out a couple of bright spots. I thought Tyler Adams was largely pretty good in a role that doesn't suit him very well. Uh, I, I think he needs a little bit of help. And with Weston and uh, Kellen Acosta, you're putting a couple brawlers out there. So to judge the forwards on today is kind of difficult. But at the same time, you just look at the resumes. And at some point, you have to stop pretending you have a system. There is no system here. They don't look like they're doing anything. And I'm not trying to be mean. I want them to win. I'm getting angry because the World Cup is literally my favorite thing in the world. And right now... You, I should not be, no one should be shaking, thinking, are we going to get out of this group? With all due respect to Wales and Iran who can play and will, can anybody can have a good day in the World Cup, if you're thinking the U.S. is not the second most talented team in the group, you know, I think you're probably one of those people who wants them to be bad. And I'm just, I'm, you know, I'm really upset because I think they need to take that Wales game to put as little on the Iran game as possible because Iran has a couple of guys who can really threaten your back line and i am not right now even as as rough as england's been they're scoring goals and our best chances over the as, as united states players over the last four days are all shots from distance and one missed header from ferrera 
Yeah, it's been rough. It's been rough for sure. Andy, let's focus on some of the superstars of this US team. I'm talking about obviously Pulisic, McKenney, Adams, but I want to give some everyone an update on Gio Reyna first because he came out in the 30th minute, walked straight down um, the tunnel. Never a good sign, especially of him given his recent injury history and record. And apparently it was muscle tightness. He put his hand up. He kicked the ball out himself, took himself out. And it's a huge blow, but hopefully not a big one. And he's, he, he's kind of taken himself out of the realms of doing serious damage long term. But we're talking about a young talent who's meant to take over the mantle from Christian Pulisic one day, if not now. And he cannot seem to trust his body to play what, two games in a few days? I mean, it, he's been out for a while, so maybe he'll get to that stage and go back to Dortmund, get some minutes playing. But how much is of a concern is that for the US heading into the World Cup where they have three group stage games in a week? You'd want Gio Reyna to be playing <laughs> the majority of all of those yeah. games, and it doesn't seem like he can do that, right? So that's the update is positive. He came off. It could have been worse. But yeah. as of right now, we'll keep you updated on Pro Soccer Talk on NBCSports.com with the latest news from Bill Harter and reaction to that. As of right now, it looks okay. But it's still not great, is it, for his confidence levels and for the U.S. team overall? Yeah, I mean, do you want him playing the majority of those games, though, in the group stage? I, I guess is the question. Well, not, not, because the the, not because of the injuries, but because... I mean, it's been about a year and a half since he's really played, uh, you know, regularly. Yeah. And I know he's had a couple of good performances for Dortmund in the Champions League, but I think we need a higher standard than that and, and a, a little bit longer of a, of a track record before I am just going to be willing to jump in and say, all right, get him back in the lineup for the most important games. We can trust him to be healthy, to impact the game, all of those things, because it is, it's been quite a while since we've really seen it from him. So I guess, and that's not to be down on Gio Reyna, that's just to say that I'm not really uh, counting on too much from him right now, because I don't think you can. I don't think realistically you can have expectations of him at this World Cup. Whatever you get from him at this point, it's almost a bonus. He's, he's also 19, and... I think that, and, and that's not a shot at him, it's to say, I don't know that he's of the the caliber at this point in his career, that even if he was healthy at 19, I'd be saying all three games. I, I like him to start one of the games, and I, I probably like him to play in every game, but I just don't know. Not that there aren't 19-year-olds who won't make difference. His his club teammate, Jude Bellingham, may make the, chan make the same um, commitment with England, but I think he'll play, I think they'll have a rotation of four guys. And the, the number one position that's going to change is going to be the winger opposite Pulisic um, and, and maybe center forward because they just don't know what they have there somehow. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. I mean, Rain has got the quality, right? If he is fit for me, he should always be in the US team. I think he has that X factor and has something that the other attackers just don't really have. Even Pulisic and Aaron are different type of players, right? But Rainer gives you that poise and ability on the ball and should be playing in a number 10 role in my opinion and not out on the wing I don't feel like he really uh that that's in in the international game I don't think that yeah. suits him very well but I mean it's it's going to be interesting there's a lot of great comments and questions coming in Andy I want to ask you about McKenney and Adams as well what did you think Nick thought Adams played well I thought he had a couple of decent chances to score right he had that one shot just went wide another one blocked a couple of uncharacteristic giveaways, which a lot of US players kind of had in that midfield defensive third. Yeah. But McKenney started well, but faded again. He's still, again, not playing regularly for Juve. So another US player and star player like Pulisic, like Reina, that not great for them going into a World Cup, right, in this kind of form. No, it's definitely not. And and the, the midfield was super interesting to me today for the, the mm -hmm. Yunus Musa reason that we already kind of talked about a little bit. But when you get Adams playing as a lone true defensive midfielder, you put a lot more stress on him as a passer, as a distributor out of the back. And obviously that's not the strength of his game. And so a couple of the, the giveaways were very worrying. But even more worrying to me is that you put a defensive midfielder, not the best on the ball, with a center back behind him and to his left, I should say, that's much worse on the ball. And so two thirds of the spine, two thirds of the foundation of the entire team, and I guess you could throw Matt Turner in there because he's more known for his shot stopping, is quite 
Now, not poor, but but a little underwhelming on the ball and how they're going to distribute out of the back. It's not always going to be on target. It's not always going to be on time, I think, is probably the more uh, important part of it. They're not always going to turn the right way. There's a lot that can go wrong when you've got a center back and a defensive midfielder at the base of the formation that are struggling on the ball. And the thing that you're trying to do is build up possession and create chances that way. Like It's not a surprise whatsoever if you look at the personnel in the starting lineup and say, well, this team's going to struggle to get the ball into the final third. And if they do, it's going to be out by the corner flags because the fullbacks got really far forward. And then they're going to do nothing from that, give the ball away, and it's going back the other direction. You could see that the second the lineup came out, and it's exactly how the game played out. So, uh, yeah, it's not the best performances individually from them, but at the same time, uh, you know, it's hard to keep dogging on the players when it feels like very few, if any, are being put in a real position to succeed, I think is my biggest issue with what we saw, especially from these two games. And Nick, you have some comments from Bill Harter coming in after that reaction to wrap up this Saudi Arabia chat. Yeah, he said he, that they're not as confident as they like. He thought they might have been worried about roster spots and were showing that the connections are not there like they want. Intensity and effort was excellent. Um, they need to keep improving, but confidence is a tricky thing. When the guys are playing confident, I know we're a dangerous team. Today, you almost saw them thinking on the field. And this goes back to kind of his out against Japan where he said they were lacking personality. Um, I wouldn't expect him to have answers after the game. I wouldn't right. expect him to say if he had an answer in his head after the game because at this point, you definitely keep it to your chest. But he doesn't sound like a man who has answers. Uh, when you no, go back doesn't. to personality and confidence – um, I mean, that's that's JV stuff. The lack of confidence thing, though, is very real. Again, I wrote about it in my reaction on NBCSports.com for this game. The lack of confidence and just belief, I think, is the key word with this US team right now. I don't know if the players believe in what they're doing. And I think that's the, the main takeaway for me from these last two games is that there is a lack of belief in the system and a lack of fluidity. Yes. And the fact that if you think about how often these players have actually played alongside each other over the last few years due to different injury issues, different rosters and all the rest of it, it it's a huge, huge concern. And uh, Andy, final point on this before we switch yeah. gears a little bit, yeah. but the, the main concern word is, is concern and worry, right? Yeah. Whose job is it to give players confidence? <laughs> And, and we th when we say confidence, I, I think a lot of people take it to mean, oh, he's played recently and he's played well. So he feels confident that he's going to play well. But I think a lot of what player confidence in, like, in a, on, on a micro level means is that there is a full mm -hmm. working understanding for everybody on the field of exactly what is expected, of, of how they're supposed to play, where they're supposed to be, but also – how the, uh, how they read and understand their teammates and where they're going to be like the greatest confidence you can have on the field is I have the ball I'm under pressure I know exactly where Eunice Musa is going to be I know exactly where Weston McKinney is going to be in this situation because we have worked on this that when I come under pressure in this area of the field this is the rotation so that we can keep the ball and move out of move out of trouble and like that just doesn't seem to exist with this team. It, it always seems like the players are having to work out the answers and solve the problems, find solutions. Find solutions was the phrase that came up, I believe, from Tyler Adams after the game against Japan. It feels like the players are the ones that have to find the solutions with this team. And I, you know, I mean, get me, don't, you know, let me know if I'm wrong, but I don't feel like that should be the case on the fly in these final two games before a World Cup. No, definitely. And I think you saw a lot of these players basically just playing within themselves and playing not to be injured and make sure we're going to be okay to get to Qatar. But that's not the way it should be in these games. Um, easy to say, but th there's no form from the US. And, and some really good comments. I mean, that one on the screen right there is perfectly sums it up. I think too many of our big players have had bad situations with their club team. Hi there, I'm Rebecca Lowe, studio host for NBC's coverage of the Premier League. Don't forget to hit subscribe to watch more videos all season long. For even more Premier League content from original series to live matches, head over to Peacock and be sure to tune in for Premier League mornings every weekend on USA Network and on Peacock. We will see you over there.